All right, so we, we kind of redid our intro last week on the heart. The heart, the Hebrew word for heart is lev or levav or levav. It comes in different forms. And uh, that's lamed vav, lev. And uh, it, the heart is the seat of thoughts, will, and emotions. And it's also said, uh, said in another way, it's the, the seat of cravings and aspirations. Cravings and aspirations. And so we looked at some kind of introductory verses uh, that, uh, you know, Yeshua encourages, this, encourages us uh, reci- reciting the Shema and the Ve'ahavta to love God with all of our heart, with all of our cravings, with all of our cravings and our aspirations, with all of our mind, will, and emotions. The Ve'ahavta itself in Deuteronomy 6 is to love God with everything that we have, all of our heart, that part of us, that dimension of us, our heart. And that's all well and good, and that is our aim. That is our target. But then we get to Jeremiah 17, which says that the heart of man is wicked above all, incurably wicked. So the, the question is, do we worship God with a wicked heart? Is that how it works? How do, we, how, do we get, how do we get around some of these things? And this series is called The Heart of the Matter because I really do believe it is the heart of is the heart of the matter we um we say often that you know some of us are are list people how many of you are list making people your checklist people okay you know who you are that that you can go through an entire day or through an entire week and um you may never stop to really enjoy what's going on you're focused on your list i gotta get my list done i gotta make i gotta check everything off and so that's how some approach living for God is that I have, to, I have to check off all the things on my list. Well, this is, a, this is only half the book and this is a big book. You're going to have a mighty massive list and it is going to run you ragged trying to check off all the things on your righteous list. <laughs> These are all the things I have to do to be righteous. Not to say that we shouldn't strive for that. We shouldn't do that. We absolutely should. But it's not just simply about doing. On the other hand, and to the other extreme, many of us come from a place where it's quote unquote all about the heart to the point where, well, God knows my heart and whatever I feel must be from God. And so I'll do that. (laughs) Was it yesterday we watched? Don't shake your head already. You don't even know what I'm going to say. Yesterday I was scrolling through Facebook, which is never a good idea, but you all do it. I was scrolling through Facebook and came upon this little video that someone shared about um, this couple that, this is from them, we are called from, our assignment from God is to share the gospel through, you'll never guess, swinging. (laughs) Not (laughs) swinging, the other kind of swinging. That is... That is from God. They believe that God said, spread my gospel. You're already swingers, so why not just throw God on top of that, and then that way, you, you, there you go. That's your mission field. And it's, it's I know, whatever. But I, I use that example just to say that upholds Jeremiah 17, that the heart of man is desperately incurably wicked and human beings are so complex and so ingeniously crafted that we will convince ourselves of all kinds of stuff I can convince myself that I'm doing a great job living for God right now when the absolute fact is that I'm messing up a lot and so we have these two sides of us Judaism calls them the Yetzer Hatov and the Yetzer Hara. The good inclination, the evil inclination, and the good inclination. Uh, New Testament Christianity calls it the flesh and the spirit. We have these, these two sides of us. Indian, a Native American culture uh, talks about the two wolves that live inside. Which one wins? The one you feed the most, Right? Buddhism has the yin and the yang. There's, there's, there's a universal truth that there are two, there's a battle inside of us always. And, and from the Bible says it is a, it is a 
incurably wicked heart and then it's the heart of God it is the two the two natures so where do we go with all this so what we're going to do over the next couple of weeks is we are going to go through uh, particular verses and just look at the role that the lev or that the heart that the cravings and the aspirations the mind will and emotions play in some of these uh, some of these aspects so we're going to start out in Genesis 5 I'm sorry, Genesis 6, I'm sorry, you were in the right place. Genesis 6, and we'll read verses 5 and 6. It says, Then Adonai saw that the wickedness of humankind was great on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of their heart was only evil all the time. So Adonai regretted that he made humankind on the earth, and his heart, his heart was deeply pained. So the aspiration and the compunction, the craving of man's heart was to do evil. Last week we spent a good bit of time, and I'll just review it because uh, several of you weren't here. We have to ask, what is the definition of evil or wickedness? They saw the wickedness of humankind and that their heart was on evil at all times. What is the definition of wickedness and evil? It, we have to define that because our understanding is going to be off so we think when I say evil if I asked you to shout out what you think is evil there would probably things were like tell me about an evil person well like Hitler was evil obviously Jeffrey Dahmer was evil obviously you know the, the people that blew up the towers on 9-11 are, are evil whether you think they were terrorists or the government I'm not getting into that um, anyway, open a can of worms there either way evil but we think of evil on the extremes. We think of mass murder. We think of, you know, just perversion. We think of the evil as extremes. And those things are evil. We can all agree that they are. What that kind of understanding causes us to think is that, well, I don't do those things. I don't live on the extremes of evil, so I must not be evil. I must be pretty good. And if that is our plumb line, if that is our gauge, then it skews everything else, right? Anybody who's ever built anything can tell you if you're building up, if this board is even, or this foundation is even a little bit unlevel, it has an exponential res effect going all the way up, right? If you're half a degree off here, you, uh, however high you go, you end up being multiple degrees off. Just like an, an angle, an angle starts out as just a little bit off, but as you go through distance and time, it begins to be this massive, huge angle. And so we have to make sure that we understand that our jumping off place. Well, as we're going to see throughout these passages and, and, and a lot of others that we won't get to read, in God's eyes, and that's really what we're concerned about, it has to be about what we're concerned about or else we, we can't really walk together. Our coming together, our community, our agreement to walk together in community has to be based upon we care about what, God's think, what God thinks, how he defines terms, how he defines things, what is his foundation that we have to jump off of, that we can walk that out together. And in God's eyes, wickedness and evilness is the opposite of righteousness. Well, what is righteousness? Well, there's a great gospel passage that really defines what righteousness is. Yeshua said, many in that day will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, have we not cast out demons? Have we not, you know, blah, 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 done all these, all these things in your name? And he says, depart from me. I never knew you. And then here's the part of the verse we never read. You who practice lawlessness. In the Greek, anomia. Nomos meaning law, a meaning the negative, anomia. In, in, in English, this is not a word, we're going to make it up, Torahlessness. Anomianism is a, a, uh, an understanding that there is no law. 1 John tells us that sin is, the definition of sin is violating the commandments, the instructions. So wickedness and evil to God or anything that goes against his instructions. That's just the plain generic, and you think, wow, that's really, that's really heavy. It really is. 
How many of you dads have ever said or ever heard it said, if you're going to live in my house, you're going to live by... Now you can live outside the house and you can live by whatever rules tickle your fancy, so to speak. But if you're going to live in this house, if you're going to enjoy these benefits, if you are going to enjoy this security, if you're going to enjoy this sustenance and this provision, there is a set of this is how we do things. Anything outside of that is not the way of the house. So for God, are the, the extremes evil? Yes, they are evil. But in, in God's kingdom, in the malchut of God, the sh not keeping the Shabbat is evil. It's wickedness. Ouch. Not, or putting things in your food hole that God said were not food is wickedness is evil that's God's don't get mad at me God said it you can take it up with him you can you can Israel you can wrestle with him okay so when Genesis 6 tells us that he saw the wickedness of humankind was great and that every inclination of the thoughts of their mind, will, and emotions, their aspirations and cravings was only evil all the time. What does that tell us about the state of humanity in Better Sheet 6? It tells us that everything they did was an effort to not do things the way God said to do them. Their main goal was to say, this is your rule? Well, we're going to do something different. Does that sound familiar? Well, this is the way that you design marriage. Well, we're going to do we're going to do everything we can not to do it that way. Well, this is what you said about our diet. I'm going to do convince myself and justify to do everything I can to not do it that way. It doesn't mean that every man, woman and child was running around murdering people at the drop of the hat. It doesn't mean that that, you know, perverseness in the sense that we think of it was just Everywhere, it was a state of mind that whatever God, whatever God's way was, was the way we're not going to do it. Again, parent children. How many of you, by a show of hands, were rebellious children? Show your hands. I know. There you go. All right. That's better sheet six. Even if your parent said something that made sense that you know would be good, you violated it anyway just because. Right? Just, be, just because. Just out of principle. <laughs> That's better sheet six. Anything Hashem says, anything Avinu says, our Father says, we're going to do the opposite just out of principle. That's wickedness. That's evil. Let's go to Genesis chapter, chapter 8. While we're going there, you know, we, we have to remember always that every instruction that God gives us is good. It is for our good. Tehillim, Psalm 119, talks all about how the law is liberty. The law is freedom. The law is life. The law is protection. It, it is those things because, it's, because God's smarter than we are. He designed all this. He knows the way it ought to work. Genesis 8 verse 21 it says when Adonai smelled the soothing aroma Adonai said in his heart I will never curse the ground again on account of man even though the inclination of the heart of humankind is evil from you The inclination, our propensity, our inclination, the inclination of our desires and aspirations is against the ways of God. That is what traditionally is called the yetzer hara, the evil inclination. That part of you that when you're eating says, I'm full, and something that says, oh, come on, just another couple of bites. Until you get sick right you gorge yourself that evil inclination that that just that wants to satiate itself and not so much that it wants the flesh to survive but that it wants to rebel against him it's that it's that teenager syndrome 
where mom and dad are stupid and just because I know everything I am going to go against everything they say that's the that's the evilness and the wickedness and we, and we can't we can't just focus though on the heart of mankind in these two passages in 6 and 8 because the, the, both of these passages talk about another heart the heart of man and all of its dreadfulness and like eh, that's really encouraging Woo! what a feel good teaching but there's also another heart mentioned here in these passages and what is that? that is the heart of God in both areas God said in his heart well does God have a heart like man? Well, you could say yes because we're created in his image and we're, we're, you know, we're a replica or a pattern after him, absolutely. But there's also a metaphor going on here to show, or an allegory, to show that, that God is not just a, um, God is not just an enforcer. God is not just a, uh, a, a far away God that is separated from his creation where if a creation steps out of line, God just, bang, you're done. Every little time someone steps out of line, you're cut off. Every time someone steps out of line, you're struck with a lightning bolt or whatever. That, that the writers are saying, the scripture is telling us that, that God is close to his creation. And, and, and in, his, in a human term, his aspiration, his craving, his emotion, his mind is, is towards us. So he says in his heart, does God process things like we do? I don't know. But the only way we can relate to that is through our own eyes, through our own humanness. And so God said in his own heart what he would do. Let's go to the next place that we see the heart in Scripture. And that's Genesis 17. And this is great. You all know this story. Genesis 17, we're going to read verses 15 through 19. And I want to take up for, for Father Abraham. Have any sons? all right verse 15 God also said to Abraham as for Sarah your wife you shall not call her by her name Sarai but rather Sarah adding the hay to her name and I will bless her and moreover I will give you a son from her I will bless her and she will give rise to nations what's the Hebrew word there goim nations goim kings of the peoples will come from her wait I'm out of, I'm out of, oh, yeah. then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart will a son be born to a hundred year old man or will Sarah who is 90 years old give birth so Abraham said to God if only Ishmael might live before you but God said on the contrary Sarah your wife will bear you a son and you must name him Isaac Yitzhak so I will confirm my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his seed after him so you've got a hundred year old man who's been promised all of these incredible first of all he comes from a family of idolatry okay let's let's Remember, and the scriptures say, forget not the pit from which you were dug. Let's not remember, you know, let's remember who Abraham is. He is a Zadik, he is a righteous. However, he didn't start out that way. He came from a land of idolatry and from a family of idolatry. And God begins to open up these beautiful promises and, and covenants and all of these things with, with Abraham. And that all bears on the ability to be able to pass that on what good is a blessing if it's just for me and to multiply it and to preserve it and so we have the Ishmael issue the firstborn not the real firstborn in depending on how you look at it and God says hey listen I'm going to do something I'm going to do it make a change in Sarah's life and she's going to give you a son and Abraham says in his he laughed and fell in his face and said in his heart does this mean that Abraham doubted God I know that's how we teach it that's how it's been preached Abraham doubted God well <laughs> let's cut Abraham some slack because if you 
answer accurately and honestly you've laughed at God before <gasps> I would never <laughs> yeah yeah you have don't dilute yourself enough to think that you've never done it have you ever been in line at Walmart and you feel that little hey pay for the person behind you or in front of you that just that little in your heart and you're like how am I going to do that I don't have enough money for that you might not fall on your face in the checkout line in Walmart and laugh but it's that attitude of like how is that going to happen how, how can I make ends meet if my groceries are $200 and I got to pay for their buggy which is full <laughs> you understand we've all done this before it has it, it doesn't have as much to do I think as we've we've made it out to be where I I'm doubting God's eternal cosmic plan for everything as it is when the word of God hits our heart our mind our aspirations and our cravings our mind will and emotions there's a there's a there's a clash that goes on there and we don't understand the way it's going to work we don't understand the logistics of it give me the one two three of how this is going to happen and Abraham laughed in his heart it didn't make sense in the thinking part of this man we cannot let instances like this taint a man of, uh, or woman in scripture for all eternity we look at this and, and it's been preached oh well Abraham was righteous but remember he laughed at God Abraham was righteous but remember he doubted God I don't I honestly can't wrap my, my head around the fact that, or the, the understanding that Abraham doubted God to the, for, to the point where his doubt was so great that it caused him to lay on the floor and, and laugh up a storm because he thought God, this God who had called him out of idolatry, this God who had called him away from his family, this God who he had forsaken everything for, now all of a sudden this God is so ridiculous, so stupid that he's going to tell you that a man, a hundred year old man and a 90 year old woman are going to have a kid come on that's how we paint this this story but every single one of us have had this kind of same interaction when God says <laughs> yeah how in the world I want you to write a book I want you to speak to this person I want you to do this I want you to do that I want you to start a business I want you to <laughs> how is that how in the world is that going to happen because we think logically because our heart as Genesis 6 and 8 told us our heart is turned away from God it is, it is, it is wicked it is, it is against the way that God works and so it's an inside process what about just letting God handle the details what about just going daddy said I'll trust him to do it the goal is what's in mind that's where I'm headed that's all that matters let's go to Genesis 20 the next place that we find in scripture talking about the heart we're going to read a lot of verses here Genesis 20 we're going to start in verse 1 I love this Then Abraham journeyed from there to the land of the Negev and settled between Kadesh and Shur. Where is Kadesh? We read a lot, a lot about that today in Hukat and in uh, Judges. So we know where this is. There's a history here. When we get to, to the Torah and to Judges, there's a history here. Started with Abraham. Where is Abraham? Kadesh. Where are the children of Israel in Parsha Hukat? Kadesh. What is Judges talking about? Kadesh. There's a lot of history here. Remember, I tell you all the time, the Bible is about a little, is about one family in a little piece of dirt in the Middle East. <laughs> that's, that's where the Bible narrative is. These people all know each other. They all know where they are. And while he was dwelling as an outsider in Gerar, Abraham said to Sarah, his wife, she is my sister 
So King Abimelech of Gerar sent for and took Sarah. <laughs> well, okay. But God came to Abimelech in a dream at night and said to him, Behold, you are as good as dead because of the woman whom you have taken, since she is a married woman. Now Abimelech had not come near her, no intimacy. So he said, My Lord, will you slay a nation even though innocent? Didn't he, come, didn't he say to me, She's my sister? And she herself even said, He's my brother? I did this with integrity of my heart and guiltlessness of my hands. Key phrases. Then God said to him in a dream, Yes, I myself know that you did this with integrity of your heart. So I, yes, I myself present, uh, prevented you from sinning against me. That is why I did not allow you to touch her. So now return the man's wife, for he is a prophet. And let him pray for you, and you will live. <laughs> but if you do not return her, know that you will surely die, you and all who are yours. So verse 8, Abimelech rose early in the morning, called all his servants, and spoke these words in their ears. And the men were frightened. And then Abimelech called to Avraham and said to him, What have you done to us, and how have I sinned against you, that you brought great sin upon me and my kingdom? You've done these things to me that should not be done. And Abimelech said to Abraham, What motivated you to do this thing? Abraham said, Because I thought there is certainly no fear of God in this place, so they'll kill me because of my wife. And besides, she really is my sister. She's my father's daughter, though not my mother's daughter. Then she became my wife. We're going to stop there and go back. I said earlier that God is not so disconnected from his creation that the minute we step out of line that he's ready to hammer us, that he's ready to, to drop the bomb on us. Which is why, for me, Genesis 6 and 8 relate to the heart of God. Man's heart versus God's heart. And here we have Abimelech. Even Abraham said, listen, I thought there wasn't any God in this place. God ain't here, Okay. And for us in this day and age, it seems like, well, wait. For me, Abimelech sinned when he took, a, took somebody. Kid, we think kidnapping. Is that what happened? This is a king, Abimelech, and a righteous man, a prophet, Avraham, who everybody knows because it's all the same little group of people over and over and over. There's these, these two people. And God didn't hold Abimelech accountable for taking Sarah. That's really interesting. So is it that God really missed something here? Like, hey God, you missed a sin. Just want to make sure you get them on all of their transgressions. Or is there something else going on here that we don't understand because there's a culture here that we don't understand? At any rate, I love what Abimelech says. And he says, I did this with integrity of heart. This proves, in my estimation, that God cares more about what your motivation is than what your action is. He cares more about the fact that you want to do rather than what the outcome actually is. Last week we read Deuteronomy 8, and we'll read it again, Deuteronomy 8 too, that says that God kept Israel in the wilderness. It wasn't their disobedience. It wasn't their outright, you know, all of the, the stiff neckedness and all this kind of stuff. It was God who kept them in the wilderness for 40 years to do what? To test them, to prove them, and to what? See if it was in their heart whether or not they would obey his commandments. How do I keep Shabbat? How do I do it right? How do I keep the feasts the right way? How do I pronounce the name of God the right way? How do I follow his calendar the right way? How do I do X, not X, Y, Z commandments the right way? That's a question that everybody has, especially if you're kind of just coming into this and trying to flesh out the overwhelming vast amount of knowledge that is out there. And Deuteronomy 8, 2 should, take some comfort, should be some comfort for you. God said, I kept you in the wilderness 
not to make sure that your checklist had all the checks by it but to see if it was in your cravings and aspirations to keep my commandments was it your desire to do what I'm asking you to do some of you because of life and the way that your circumstances are you have to work a job on Shabbat or part of Shabbat now some teachers will tell you quit and trust God to find you a job that doesn't work on Shabbat listen if you've got that much faith knock yourself out go for it and I believe God will honor it but this guy is not going to be responsible for telling you you have to quit your job and just wait around twiddling your thumbs till God gives you another one if you feel like that's what you're supposed to do fine but I am more interested in is your desire to keep the Shabbat is it in your heart to keep his commandments how many of the commandments can we even keep today well a mere fraction of what's actually in there but is it my desire to give offerings in the temple is it my desire to be in Jerusalem for the the three pilgrimage feasts is it my desire to love my neighbor as myself is it my desire to love God with all of my heart absolutely where we get into a lot of trouble and, and issues is in when, when we begin to say, well, I love God with my heart, and somehow that's separate from actually doing something. You understand what I'm saying? We, we have a really good ability to separate the heart from the action and say, well, God knows my heart, and I, you know, I want to serve him, but I'm not, I don't want to enough where I'm willing to actually do stuff. And you can say that it's in your heart to love God and to serve God, but if there's no try there, if there's no attempt, if there's no really, if we crave something, how many of you have made a Taco Bell run at midnight or a, you know, you've ordered a, a pizza at all hours of the, you know, Chinese food at any time of the day or night because you had a craving? Human beings are strong enough and resourceful enough that if we have a craving we will get what we want so when we say well, my, my heart is after God what we're saying in, in actual is that my cravings and aspirations are after God but if that doesn't produce anything in line with God then which heart are we dealing with and Abimelech certainly did not keep the Torah but what he did was integrity of heart he was honest in his heart and that's really all we can ask of each other because I think that's what God asks of us what we cannot let ourselves do is say well I know that this is a violation of God's instructions but it's okay with my heart you see the breakdown Abimelech, Abimelech was not trying to do something against God's instructions his heart was right he was trusting Abraham's word that this was not his wife and so his intention was to be honorable in whatever shape form or fashion you see that in but when we can say well God called us to spread the gospel by being swingers because our, that's what's on our heart those, those things don't match Th those, I don't care what your heart is saying at that point those things don't match well, well, you know, God laid it upon my heart. I've used this example before. God laid it upon my heart to, you know, divorce my husband and move in with a, another guy. That, mm, uh, it makes my eyes twitch. I can't. And those are kind of extreme, extreme things. But we can very easily say, well, God knows my heart is to keep his commandments. But meanwhile... I'm really going to enjoy this pork chop. You know what I mean? Like, oh, God knows my heart, but those buttery shrimp are sure looking good. You know what I mean? Those, if, if we take it down on a really practical level, well, God knows my heart, um, but I'm just, I'm, I can't do Shabbat this week. Uh, there's a disconnect there. There's a disconnect there. God holds his law up above our heart and what our heart desires and I think it's a fascinating story about Abimelech just going to God and saying look I, 
I, I did the best I could. I knew I was trying to be honest. And God going, yeah, you're right. I kept you from sinning because I knew that wasn't your intention. Wow. That's amazing. God saw the integrity of his heart. Was Abimelech a good dude? I don't know. But God saw in that aspect the intent of his heart and kept him from sinning. I just think that's phenomenal. That's a beautiful, beautiful story. Now we're running out of time. I want to couple of cover, uh, cover a couple more verses. Let's go to Genesis 24. And we'll start in verse 42. Just read a few verses here. Verse 42. So I came to the spring and said, Adonai, the God of Abraham, my master, if you're really going to make my way uh, to make my way upon which I'm walking successful look I'm standing by the spring of water let it be that the unmarried girl who is going out to draw water to whom I'll say please give me a little water to drink from your jug and she'll say to me you drink and I'll draw for your camels also let her be the woman when Adonai appoints for my master's or whom Adonai appoints for my master's son I had not yet finished speaking to my heart and behold, there was Rivka, Rebecca, going out, and her jug was on her shoulder, and she went down to the spring and drew water. So I said to her, please give me drink. And we know the, the rest of the story. This is the looking for, for the, the wife. And he says in his heart, he's working all this stuff out in his heart, in his mind, in his, in his will, in his, in, his, in his cravings and aspirations. He's working these things out, saying, okay, this is logic. See, we've said before, but I think so many times we over spiritualize the the scriptures to a point where we can't relate there's a disconnect there the heart is such an over spiritualized thing that nobody knows what it means well what is the servant doing in this particular uh, account is that he's thinking through how God is going to work this thing out there's nothing spiritual about it he's thinking through the logistics how is this going to work and he is putting up markers to say this is how I, I think this is going to happen this is how I need this to happen so that I know so the, the heart is this supernatural spiritual thing but it's also this really logical thing where we have to work things out with God and we do it all the time there's a, a, a danger again where we go like God's going to provide X, Y, Z and in the meantime my job is to just sit on my behind until it manifests that's a heart issue because we are responsible to work out in our heart how, how what is our responsibility what are we to do he said of himself I have to say please give me a little water from your jug and then she'll respond he didn't go well God if this you know whatever unmarried girl comes out whatever maiden comes whoever just I'll just sit there and if she speaks first and says these things then I'll then then that'll be the one I have to initiate it and he had to work that out in his heart he had to get his mind around that and decide he had to take some action and had to be responsible Genesis 27 38 through 41 it says Esau said to his father do you just have one blessing my father bless me too and Esau lifted up his voice and wept then Isaac his father said to him behold away from the land's fatness shall your dwelling be away from the dew of the sky above by your sword shall you live and your brother sh shall you serve but when you teach your, or tear yourself loose you will tear his yoke off your neck so Esau bore a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him and Esau said in his heart let the time for mourning my father draw near so that I can kill my brother Jacob uh, I'm going to pick up on this next week because there is uh, no not next week in two weeks there is a lot going on here I've always struggled with the fact that Jacob is this in my mind is this scrawny little manipulative worm that seems to do everything underhandedly and wrong and still gets the blessing and that ticks me off because it doesn't make sense it's not right and every time I read the story of Jacob I just think you, you little worm like how 
And it seems like he gets off going, I got the blessing. I got, and Esau is just, how could this happen? Well, there's another side to Jacob that we, we don't read in here, and it's a side I want to present to you guys in a couple weeks that really shows a different heart. And so we're going to leave off there, and we're going to talk uh, in two weeks about the heart of Jacob and the heart of Esau and see what we see in those, those things. So, Father, we bless you today for your word. I thank you, Father, for the, the, the Torah reading, for the, the gospel reading that spoke of our Messiah being placed in a tomb where he would not stay because on the third day he would be resurrected to live as the eternal Mashiach. I thank you for that resurrection that gives us hope that there is life that there is life in him that there is life in the way he lived that he was the Zadik that he was the righteous one who was so close to you that you, he lived with the same heartbeat as the father and so father I thank you for the, the word for the worship for the community for the hugs for the laughs for the smiles for the burdens that we bear with each other I thank you for this Shabbat, Father. There is absolutely no time like this in the rest of our week. And this is a, a sanctuary in time, a tabernacle in time. And we thank you, Father. We thank you for it. I thank you for those who have joined us by live stream. And I pray your blessings on the rest of this Shabbat as it begins to come to a close this evening, that we would be rested for the job you have for us to do this coming week that we would be ready and engaged to push out the borders of your kingdom this next week with Shabbat as a launch pad. We bless you and we thank you in Yeshua's name. And everyone said amen.